Environmental, environmental engineering. Environmental engineering. And uh, before moving into um, the Penn State University of Arizona, the University of Arizona Center for Chemical and Environmental Engineering at Penn State, Jody had her pioneers in the world of uh, research going into commerce and application of applied electrochemical systems. So without any further um, delay, uh, we okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much for uh, coming out to listen to this. I um, want to start by saying I, I never really planned on getting into energy. Uh, mostly, my plan was to work in water, but. As you start working in water, you realize it takes a lot of energy. And in California, that could be 18% of your electricity goes into your water infrastructure. So as soon as you're talking about water, you're talking about energy. And the more energy you use, of course, the more that you have to think about climate change. And the more you think about climate change, you think about how that's altering water cycles and energy utilization. And you get into this uh, a big circle, but primarily through energy and water. Now, um, I don't always know what everybody's background is relative to energy, so I want to try and put energy on a very personal basis with a question. You eat 2,000 calories a day, which are 2,000 kilocalories. So 2,000 calories a day on a continuous basis, how many 100-watt light bulbs would that be? If you've never done the calculation, it's an interesting one. You might guess 10, 15, well, the answer is one. And so that should, you know, you think about the food that you eat to keep you running all day, and that seems like a lot of energy, but a 100-watt light bulb doesn't seem like a lot of energy. On the other hand, um, not everything we eat goes into uh, uh, usable work. Some of it goes, shall we say, down the drain, and that's equal to about uh, an incandescent 23, 25-watt light bulb. So. If you're going to try and run your home based on your wastewater production, it's not going to work. But when you get a large number of people in a town, a couple hundred thousand people, you start to talk about megawatts of power. So there's some power there to be regained. Um, and if you look at the total po uh, power consumption per person, you know, you've got homes and cars and industry and transmission and losses, and it's about 100 times greater. So I'm not going to try and convince you today that we can run the whole infrastructure on wastewater. Um, and even running it strictly on biofuels is not possible. But what I'd like to address is how we can produce a significant portion of energy through uh, some very simple things, really just water and wastewater. So let's look at some other numbers uh, relative to this now. So the water infrastructure within the U.S. is about 3 to 5 percent. I've seen numbers 7 or 8 percent of our electricity. And imagine expanding that globally, that amount of electrical power consumption globally for a, for a global water infrastructure. It, it, there's just not enough energy to go around. Uh, not only that, the processes that we use for our water and wastewater infrastructure is generally going up through the use of membrane processes, uh, in water treatment, for example, for desalination and for wastewater treatment. So we're kind of, we're in a bad situation, right? We're using more energy and we're starting to run out of energy. So instead of looking at these things as being energy sinks, why not look at these as being energy sources? And in particular, uh, I'll talk mostly here about two uh, and most of the time about the first one, um, the domestic wastewater or industrial wastewaters contain about two to five kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And if you look at that on a per cubic meter basis, there's, geez, almost about 10 times more energy in the wastewater than we're using to treat it with conventional technologies. So let's look at a future where instead of a wastewater treatment plant being an energy consumer, 
it's a power plant. The other one I'll talk about is salinity gradient energy, and I'll, I'll explain how we can actually extract electrical power from salt water. So these are microbial fuel cells. Um, we haven't built very big ones. This is probably the biggest one we've built. It's just a few liters. Um, and we keep this one running on the right, mostly to demonstrate that, yes, you can directly transform organic matter into electrical current. There's no intermediate, no moving parts. The only moving part here is actually this fan. Um, the electricity is directly generated by those microorganisms. So um, as you know, we proposed this idea, it's uh, at first met with somewhat uh, less than enthusiastic and believing response. And so we like to think about revolutionary ideas. Revolutionary ideas go through three stages, they say. They go first through the denial phase. Can't be done. Then as you make a little bit more progress, people say, well, you know, it's possible, but it's not worth doing. And we're probably at that stage right now. People are saying, well, you know, is this worth doing? Is it going to work out? But if you succeed, they say it was a good idea all along. So we hope to be there. Um, in the water industry, there's a couple examples of that. RO reverse osmosis membranes for desalination, they were never going to work. They were too expensive just to still the water. Um, my, uh, membrane bioreactors, it's a stupid idea to put a membrane in a wastewater tank. and so. Little by little, all these things have uh, been shown to succeed. And maybe we're there with microbial fuel cells. And in fact, we're seeing some of those signs just because some large companies like uh, GE, Veolia, Siemens, and Dow are doing work in this area. There are some startup companies in this area as well. Um, and now there are companies that are actually specializing in building materials for these systems. So there's promise on the horizon. At least that's what I'd like to try and convince you of today. So how does this work? Well, the microbes uh, break that exist naturally in nature can break down organic matter. You keep them away from the, what they want to use to breathe, just like you and I eat food and we breathe, we use oxygen. We break down organic matter, release those electrons, and then we send those electrons through a series of respiratory enzymes in our body, transfer those to oxygen, and then we exhale the uh, water vapor, right? So that all works pretty well. The bacteria, are some bacteria able to transfer these electrons to a solid surface and then the counter electrodes exposed to oxygen. So there's a potential difference between those two and the electrons flow through the wire and create electrical current and electrical power. And these devices can be very simple. This is just a, a piece of plastic with a hole in the middle with two electrodes on either side. One's exposed to air where the oxygen's reacting, the other one's not. And so the bacteria are kept away from that oxygen, and then it can make this electrical power. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the microbes and how they can accomplish this. And this has created what's called um, sort of a subdiscipline of microbiology, uh, electromicrobiology. Um, and that means that uh, a microbiology lab looks a little bit different. It's kind of like uh, Frankenstein's lab a little bit more. There's more wires probably than, than uh, microbes where we have uh, all this uh, electron, electrical equipment that we need to test and monitor and develop these systems. But in principle, this is really very simple. Um, so nature operates on cycles. And so if there are electrogens, microbes that can produce an electrical current, it stands to reason that there should be microbes that can accept those electrons. So donating electrogens, uh, accepting and loving it, electrotrophs. Let's first talk about the electrogens. We take one of these electrodes, we put it into one of these little reactors. The bacteria very quickly form these biofilms that are uh, uh, essentially wired together. And so here we are trying to make nanowires and looking at how to do this. And bacteria perhaps have been doing this for a billion years. They synthesize these electrically conductive appendages that allow them to connect up uh, to not only a network, but ultimately to a surface, presumably in nature for the, the original purpose of sending electrons to metal oxides, to breathe with solid surfaces. So these bacteria can make these nanowires, and they're uh, highly conductive. They use the uh, nanowires that they make to send electrons. Some uh, microbes use mediators. They produce 
shuttles, things that can be reversibly oxidized and reduced, and so bounce between a surface and the microbe. Some microbes have to maintain direct contact. And then there's always other microbes in these electrogenic communities which serve functions which we don't fully understand. Um, there's some nice uh, work that's come out of uh, Derek Lovely's lab, and they wanted to look at how electrically conductive these biofilms were. So they grew biofilms across a non-conductive uh, um, uh, space here, and then they let those biofilms overgrow that non-conductive space. And by making measurements across that biofilm, they were able to determine how conductive these biofilms were. And it turned out that they were more conductive than the graphite plates and uh, some of the other materials that we were using in these systems to actually make the biofilms. So they're quite conductive. Um, the nanowires that I talk of span uh, on the order of uh, nanometers to microns. So uh, in many cases, even longer than the cell. Biofilms that develop on these electrodes are typically on the order of about uh, 50 microns, around 60, 70, not more than 100 microns. It seems after that the cells will dissociate and um, perhaps due to um, conductivity being over too large a distance in, in that direction um, or to other reasons. But um, recently it, it's been discovered that actually there are filamentous bacteria growing in nature. So this is one strand of bacteria connected and the conductivity is along this filament. And the way they discovered this was they actually found sediments where these redox potentials were maintained in these sediments which shouldn't exist. The only way they could exist is if they were wired together. And by, by essentially uh, slicing up that sediment, they were able to show that um, when they removed the, the possibility of electrical conductivity, that those um, gradients were uh, greatly altered. So actually, we don't know where the limit on this is. But right now, at least, we're up to uh, distances on the order of centimeters for these electrically conductive biofilms. So what about electrotrophs? So these are microbes that will now pull an electron into the cell, and they will still need to be discharged, but ultimately to something else. So um, they can go to many different things, soluble materials like nitrate um, or oxygen, or, uh, 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 and they can actually go to uh, soluble metals and, and precipitate them. Uh, the evidence for this is when these microbes develop on a biofilm, you can see the uh, power densities and voltages increasing over time as the biofilm is developed. If you kill that biofilm, it reverts back down to its original power density. So clearly, they're obtaining um, uh, energy from this. They're not true catalysts because they obtain energy from the process, but they are reducing the overpotential of the electrodes, effectively um, catalyzing the reaction, but taking a little bit home for themselves, as it were, as well. And so this has been shown with nitrate and oxygen, this enhancement. Um, it's also been shown with, uh, as I said, some metals and some other compounds. The one that's been of particular interest to us is the CO2 reduction or CO2 fixation by methanogens. So for many uh, decades or more, I don't know how long, um, the classic theory on how methanogens, or one of the ways that methanogens make methane, but um, they interact with fermentative organisms which can break down organic matter like, say, glucose, ferment it into uh, acetic acid and hydrogen. <coughs> this happens, these electrons are transferred very quickly through the microbes and, in fact, it's a very fast reaction. Then this hydrogen has to diffuse over a very long path to get to the methanogen where, again, the hydrogen is processed very quickly through the cell. So basically, you're going through hydrogen formation and then hydrogen consumption. Well, that seems rather time-consuming and wasteful. Why not have direct electron transfer between these two microorganisms? That way, you don't even need to make the hydrogen and you're not limited by the potentials, the redox potentials for formation and oxidation of hydrogen. So um, uh, let me skip that one. So we, um, you know, we question what's the evidence for this direct electron transfer. So we, we found some, uh, uh, some early work, some uh, possible evidence for that because there were fermentative organisms growing in coal culture with methanogens and you can see that these things are connected together. And originally it was thought, well, Maybe these are just held in close proximity. But 
That's not very close proximity. But when uh, measurements were made on the electrical conductivity of these appendages, they were found to be electrically conductive. Now, that's not proof that the cells are exchanging electron or exchanging current, but it supports the theory of direct electron transfer. Later on, um, we obtained some cultures, and we enriched those cultures through growth on an electrode in the absence of anything on the anode. So this is just sending current through an electrode. A methanogenic biofilm grew on that electrode, which was primarily a methanobacterium uh, palustris. And we saw CO2 fixation and methane production. And if hydrogen had been an intermediate, then we could never exceed a low rate of gas production based on the rate at which we could evolve hydrogen from that electrode. So we're just limited by the formation and, and evolution of hydrogen. But in this system, whoops, you can see that the um, hydrogen evolution, uh, the methane evolution rate was far greater than that of the um, uh, hydrogen evolution rate. We also showed with an ATCC culture that we could accomplish the same thing in terms of enhancement, <coughs> excuse me, although not as at a great rate, suggesting that um, perhaps the uh, lab culture was not as efficient as the natural one, that is, through cultivation, had lost that ability uh, to facilitate that electron transfer. Um, there's also been some work which has looked at anaerobic um, digesters, and what these uh, what these researchers found was, were that the granules that form in these anaerobic digesters are very dense, and the microbes grow very close to each other. And on measuring the electrical conductivity of the granules, they found that the conductivity was high. A rather strange result that there would be electrical conductivity in these granules unless there was uh, electrons being transferred. Um, Conductivity is threefold higher than previously reported, even for pure culture species where there are uh, between electron transfer between these bacteria. Um, in another uh, study, it was shown that um, when they added activated carbon to methanogenic cultures, which is electrically conductive as well, that the rate of methanogenesis was enhanced, thereby also extending the possibility of uh, electron transfer from the methanogens. And here's where um, I have to have a little fun as an academic at these studies because um, these guys uh, sort of put a new twist on these uh, three stages of a revolutionary idea. In fact, this lab that recorded, reported those other two studies said in 2010, uh, the possibility to use methanogenic microorganisms to reduce carbon dioxide to methane at the cathode by our study had been, uh, um, you know, well, we tried to replicate it, and those experiments have been unsuccessful. So what they were really saying was, it can't be done. Then, a few years later, they go, um, this shows for the first time in these uh, digester aggregates that electron transfer could be an important mechanism. So here's my, here's my uh, funny take on this. There are now three different stages. The first one is it can't be done. The second one is possible. The third one is now. It was my idea. <laughs> so, and if you can't have a sense of humor about this stuff, don't go into science, I guess. Um, so now we're, we're, we're grappling with this issue, and, and we don't have the answers for this, you know, but, but my sense is that the electrogens are making these nanowire connections, that they are, it's in their benefit to dump electrons somewhere. They don't care where they dump them. They want to get rid of them. And so methanogens, have taken advantage of that. Other microbes have taken advantage of that. But we don't know how specific these interactions are. Is it one fermentative organism looking for one methanogen? Is it like a, you know, an enzyme thing, a, a, if you will, in electrical terms, a plug and socket? Okay. Uh, but maybe it's different. You know, maybe you know, not all plugs look the same. And so that plug doesn't fit in that socket, and that plug doesn't, you know, if that's the European one, the other one's the UK one. Or maybe there are universal adapters. You know, some microbes will take electrons from anyone, and maybe there are electrical donors that send them to everyone. So we don't know how specific these plug and socket ideas are, um, and that 
can compromise our ability to do some of these experiments because we may not be putting the right plug on the electrode or the right socket on the electrode, and that's what we need to, to figure out. Um, it turns out that making electricity is economically not such a good idea because electricity is really cheap. Um, when you really look at the value of commodity chemicals and things you can make, it's pretty cheap. So instead of trying to make electricity, um, which actually we can do it, these are a range of current densities that we can get in uh, laboratory tests. Maybe if we made something that was worth more money, like, say, hydrogen, um, then we might have a better uh, economic picture. And in fact, the current densities and systems that we can make hydrogen in are actually uh, pretty close to those uh, m uh, microbial fuel cells. There are other things that have been looked at to be made in the system, and I, I don't have time to go into that here, but um, I'll talk about methane uh, as a part of that, of course. So how do you make hydrogen in this system? <clears throat> well, it turns out that you take a microbial fuel cell, which is making elect electrical power. You have about 0.3 volts at the anode and about 0.2 volts at the cathode. Overall, about a half a volt of potential. If you take away the oxygen, uh, actually, I should have those bubbles stop. Actually, everything ceases. It's, nothing will happen because you have 0.3 volts at the anode. You need 0.414 volts to evolve hydrogen at the cathode. So in order to get hydrogen to evolve at the cathode, you actually have to add in a little bit of voltage. And so if you boost that voltage, but only by a few tenths of a volt, say, compared to water splitting, which can take theoretically 1.2, but in practice closer to 2 volts, you can actually now turn these electrons that are going through the circuit and the protons that are being released here and evolve hydrogen at that cathode. So this is an electrochemical hydrogen production, but biologically derived from electrons. So you're, the bacteria are splitting organic matter. They're not splitting water, and that's why the voltage is much less. Similarly, you take that system, and whether you have direct electron transfer or not, if you have methanogens consuming hydrogen or directly consuming electrons, you have a way to turn this electrical current into um, methane. And you can do that, presumably, with a renewable power source. So you could have windmills or solar panels actually generating this. And this would synthesize methane. Now, if you try to electrochemically synthesize methane, that is not use microbes on an electrode, you need precious metals, you get a variety of gases coming off that metal. If you put methanogens on there, you get one thing, and that's methane. And so it's very clean, and the methanogens are nice. They grow, and so you don't need to go buy some more precious metals to do this. Um, we've been most interested in uh, finding metals that might even lower the overpotential relative to direct electron transfer. Um, stainless steel works well. It's cheap, but it has a high overpotential. That means it's not much uh, better than uh, just direct electron transfer. Molybdenum disulfide shows, shows some promise, uh, and there's some excellent work being done uh, at Stanford. And this is just showing you that if you have direct electron transfer, you need about a volt. And, um, but if you go to, say, platinum, which you don't want to because it's a precious metal, or you start to go to molybdenum, that you can, working in this area, you might get down into a range which is less than a volt. So the hope is to either find a better way to plug and socket the methanogens up for direct electron transfer, or find better ways to evolve hydrogen and have them use the hydrogen. <coughs> so um, the, the idea of doing this has really uh, uh, been very stimulating. But of course, just because you can do it doesn't mean it's going to be economically viable to do that. So what we've been focusing on is trying to figure out ways to scale up these systems, but to do so in an economical way. Uh, as I said, this is about the biggest one we've built. And you know, uh, we, the thing costs several thousand dollars to machine, and it, all it can do is run this tiny little fan. So we've got to do a better job of that. So let's see how we might go about doing that. Um, the first is that you have to consider the architecture and what the best spacing of electrodes, type of electrodes, flow paths. Do we use uh, hollow fibers? Do we use round reactors, square reactors? And we, we've done all that. And so we now know the answer to that. We also have to shoot for a cost. And these are a couple of papers that said, to be economically competitive, you need to make these electrodes for about 100, 100 euros per square meter, or 100 
$30 per square meter. So that's our target. Make them cost less than about $100 a square meter. So if we were to do that um, with technology of, say, five or six years ago, here's what it would cost. We'd start with a tank, and nobody ever includes the cost of the tank, so I'm not going to include that. Um, but we'd take that tank, we'd put the wastewater in it, for example, and um, that costs nothing, that's free. Uh, we put an anode electrode in there. There's a cost of that. It's carbon cloth. The bacteria grow in that electrode. We put in a cathode. Now, that cathode can react with dissolved oxygen and water, but it takes lots of energy to put that oxygen in water, so we want to expose to air. So if we're going to have it directly exposed to air, we need to prevent the water from leaking out. So we put in uh, what we call a diffusion layer. That also controls oxygen transfer into the reactor. And then to make the system produce more power, we move the anode close to the cathode because that reduces internal resistance, keep the electrodes closely spaced. Not too closely spaced that they touch, and so you put in some sort of separator like you would in a battery to prevent those electrodes from getting too close to each other. Um, the cathode is probably the most difficult thing to engineer and the most costly. You have, typically this was carbon cloth. On the carbon cloth, you needed a catalyst. That catalyst was platinum. You had to hold the platinum to the carbon cloth, which meant you needed a binder. That was nafion. And if you looked at all those costs, um, per square meter now, you, the carbon cloth is about $1,000 a square meter. The binder, it turns out, is almost, well, it's about the same price, essentially, as the platinum catalyst. And so you're looking at something like $2,000 a square meter. You're never going to get enough electricity back from this system to justify that kind of cost. So what did we do? We reduced the cost. The anode, we estimate somewhere around $20 for a square meter of anode surface area. And about the same thing for the cathode. Um, and I'll show you how we did that through the different materials of uh, uh, the catalyst and binder and uh, diffusion layer and so forth. So we're looking at materials cost somewhere around $40, $50 a square meter. That says we should be able to do this now, at least from a materials point of view. So the first thing is, how are we going to deal with the architecture? We take one of these little reactors, and we essentially want to put a whole series of them together. And so if we do that, we can have, say, a, a, an air chamber in between adjacent air chambers. OK, that's new. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, this is what happens when a guy uses a PC, uses a Mac. Help me, somebody. That little X? Not so simple. It's somewhere in Anchorage. That's good. Any other suggestions from the audience? Did it just the right way and it brought up the dashboard? <laughs> you could force a quit and I'll just restart it. You can open this window by skipping command option. And, well, let's see, while I have your attention, I can tell you a few jokes. Uh, <laughs> um, so while this is going on, I'll, I'll uh, say that the idea here is that now we're going to try and get these things with uh, very s small spacing, with the wastewater essentially going between um, adjacent anodes and then having very thin air channels between these. So we're, we'll start to make these thin little modules that we can link up together. Wow. 
Why would a mouse help? I just pulled this out. <laughs> that oh, that was the yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Ah. Of course, that's not where you want it to be, though. That's okay. <laughs> that was an F5. That's right. Mm. Well, let's mm. got to put it back in. So here's, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Um, so here's the, the idea is we're having, like these little cubes, we just have electrodes, two anodes on either side, a thin air channel. And so we can make these in sort of a little modular format and then just slice them all together. And as we, for example, if we have a 10 centimeter spacing and we've got uh, 10 of these in a meter, we've got 10 square meters per cubic meter. If we've got 100 of them, we've got 100 square meters. And that then gives us our energy density that we can produce in the system. These air chambers between here can be very narrow. Um, so that doesn't take up much uh, space. So it's really the uh, conduit for the wastewater and how we're going to grow the bacteria. So we needed a material for the anode that would have high surface area, high electrical conductivity, would be easy to clean. And we didn't know where to look, so we just looked in the lab and we saw these nice little bottle brushes lying around that we used to clean beakers and stuff. We thought, well, what if we made that out of graphite fibers? And so we actually created this electrode, which has a very high surface area for the bacteria. And then this little twisted metal core here serves, uh, serves as a current collector and efficiently pulls those electrons back into the system. These, uh, this is actually voltage over nearly 100 days of operation of one of these systems. And you can see the great maintenance of power density by these brushes, whereas some of these other materials we used actually were dropping off in performance. So these uh, Brush anodes can work over, so far we've run them for several years without seeing a drop off in power. So our modified design now looks a little something like this. We actually have a series of brushes in here with the wastewater flowing uh, between these brushes and then these thin, narrow air channels. So that's how we want to make the system, but the, I haven't told you how we're going to make the cathode. Um, the cathode, as it turns out, we don't want to use platinum, but there's a company in Belgium making cathodes out of activated carbon. Activated carbon is very, very cheap. It's made out of peach pits and coconut shells and, and bark and wood and things like that. So it's quite renewable. Um, and, in the, um, and if you uh, press that onto a current collector of stainless steel mesh, you can actually achieve a cathode which has the same sort of power production characteristics as these systems made with precious metals, with platinum. Um, we also deduced through building a variety of architectures that it was really the cathode with, within these systems which would limit power. That is, the more cathode we put in per volume, more area of cathode per volume, the more power we got per volume. So the more and more cathodes we can put into these reactors, the more power we're going to get. So now that's good because from an engineering perspective, we know what to focus on. We design around the cathode surface area. This says the same thing, I'll skip that. Um, one of the questions, though, which comes up is, you know, how long do these cathodes last? And so um, I had a student do an experiment. Um, I asked her to do this for five years, but she refused. So, um, but I did talk her into 12 months. So she ran these reactors for a year, and uh, these are two different porosities of this diffusion layer on the outside that keeps it from leaking. And you can see the decrease in the power over time. Uh, from 1,200 down to 700 or about 1,000 down to 800. So it uh, decreased by about 20% over that year. And w the question was, well, was that the anodes? And without going into the details of this figure, basically this is showing how the anode responds at different potentials to, uh, to produce current. And basically it said after a year it was completely unchanged. So the anode or the microbes that Mother Nature had been perfecting for about a million years or however long, billion years, um, was actually working great. It was the cathode that wasn't working so well. And we noticed that the cathode was covered by a biofilm. So we thought, well, maybe we just need to remove that biofilm. Um, whoops, those things have moved. They should be down here. Um, what we found was that if we replaced the cathode, we got about the same amount of power back. After one year, the power was down here. And if we cleaned it, we just removed that outside biofilm we only got a slight increase 
in power. So it really wasn't that biofilm growing on the outside of the cathode. It was whatever was inside the cathode and, and potentially fouling our electrode. So um, we needed to find better ways to maintain activity. And since we haven't published this yet, um, I've erased all information as to how we achieved this. But um, what you can see is this is activated carbon, our, our best activated carbon in green. And this is platinum in orange. And you can see the orange one after a month and after two months was actually dropped off quite a lot. But the activated carbon one here with this treatment is actually after two months pretty much spot on for where we are. So we've actually gotten more power than we did out of our untreated cathode, activated carbon cathodes, and it, it seems to be quite stable. So that's a very promising uh, development. The other issue is how we hold the activated carbon to the current collector. Um, I mentioned nafion early on, and nafion is quite expensive. And actually, when you put it in water, um, it's negatively charged. So counter ions set up across that, and the protons actually uh, experience a charge repulsion when trying to diffuse through that uh, binder material. So we've been looking um, at some different binders, uh, those that can avoid this charge repulsion. We found a couple of them. One is a, a quaternary ammonium group. Uh, Mike Hickner and his uh, postdoc uh, developed this, and it's quite stable over many cycles of operation, so it's working well as a binder. And uh, another one, very surprisingly to us, was uh, PDMS or silicon, and basically um, it seems to be performing quite well uh, compared to Nafion as well. So we're still, we don't have long-term data on that, but at least after many cycles it was still doing quite well. And finally, um, the separator, the thing that keeps the electrodes from touching each other. We've used some very inexpensive and simple materials like uh, glass fiber or, uh, or fabric cloths. And uh, they work about as well as each other, primarily because what they're doing is uh, forming an insulating layer between the electrodes. But we also noticed a, a, a disturbing trend. As we tried different separators, we found that if we got higher power density down here, we lost a lot of electrons to essentially oxygen leaking in the system. So this is columbic efficiency. It's the percent of electrons that actually go to current as opposed to other things. And so we could get more power, but we lost the electrons going on the circuit. If we made the uh, separators more tightly woven, then we cut down the oxygen leaking into the system but the protons then had a tougher time of getting to the cathode. And so we had this trade-off between power and electrical current recovery. So we really want something up here. And uh, uh, again, Mike Hickner uh, came up with a good idea of using uh, polyvinyl alcohol separators. And the uh, preliminary data shows with different amounts of poration that we're up in this region of, of very high columbic efficiencies and good power densities as well. So without um, dwelling on all the details of the materials, what I hope is that I've shown you that individually these materials seem to have overcome previous limitations of longevity and cost. And so what we hope to do is to uh, build these into these systems now and to improve power production. Um, the other thing we need to do, of course, is show that this really works on domestic wastewater or wastewater sources and not just on phosphate buffers and acetate in the laboratory under optimal conditions. And I can tell you that, yes, acetate produces power up here, but when you go to like a domestic wastewater, the power is down there. It's not going to produce as much power for various reasons, including the strength of the organic matter and the uh, electrical conductivity of the water and some other factors. But the question for wastewater treatment is, can we treat the wastewater? Can we get the organic matter out? And the treatment levels that we achieve are pretty comparable to a trickling filter. We get about 80% of the, of the uh, BOD or COD removal of, of the organic matter in the wastewater. And we've done this with uh, uh, you know, a variety of tests. And these were tests done over about half a year in time. Um, I don't know if there are any wastewater people in the audience, but just to say that there are ways that we make this trickling filter achieve better performance uh, and equal to activated sludge, which uses a lot more power. Um, but uh, the hope is by using the same sort of add-on processes that we used in trickling filters, we can also improve the overall treatment efficiencies in these systems as well. 
We've also started to build slightly bigger systems in terms of multiple electrodes. Again, if we're going to build these things in square meters, we're going to have hundreds or thousands of electrodes in the system. And so um, we really don't have much experience, especially being um, you know, environmental engineers, at wiring these things together. And when we first started running these tests with this, this is just a three anode, three brush system, we found something um, very curious. It, it didn't work very well. Um, and so we, to understand it, what we did is we decoupled the system. This is with all the anodes wired on the same circuit. This is with each anode wired to a separate resistor. And then this is two reactors which process the wastewater in, in um, uh, half the time. And so two of these process the same wastewater as two of those. And here's what we found. So this is a one that isn't working very well. The voltage is very low. All the anodes wired together. If we individually wired them, you could see that the voltage was higher in that first one where the wastewater was coming in, but it decreased as these electrodes, as the wastewater flowed across the electrode. And so what would happen is you had electrodes at different potentials and you wired them together. You're essentially shorting them out to each other. But by going to a shorter retention time where there's very little change in organic, less of a change of organic matter in the system, they have more equal potentials. And when that happens, they have greater voltage generation, and we get much greater operation in this system. So we've not only answered the question of, of treating the wastewater, but now we have an idea of retention times and how to link these systems together. Um, so there are still challenges remaining on, on making this work with wastewater, but the good news is we, if we keep the hydraulic retention times in these systems short, we can get the power out quickly. Um, I mentioned that environmental engineers are not particularly good electrical engineers, so um, I, uh, I had no idea on how we were actually going to capture this low voltage. The electrical engineers told us 0.3 volts is really crappy and, you know, it's going to be very hard to do that effectively. But fortunately, I had some very bright people in my lab and they came up with this idea. Now, if you try and hook two microbial fuel cells together like you would batteries in a flashlight just all in a row to multiply the voltage, they short each other out. They, the second one eats the voltage from the first one, and you get nothing. So they said, here's what we should do. We should actually have these things not charge each other, but charge capacitors. And they can charge them in parallel so it avoids that series operation. In parallel, they work OK when they're both going in the same direction, as long as they don't go through each other. And then. We'll charge this for a second, and then we'll flip over to another set of capacitors, and then we'll take the ones that we had and we'll discharge those capacitors, but we'll discharge the capacitors in series. So you charge them this way and discharge them this way, and then you boost the voltage. And in fact, with just one not my day. So with one uh, MFC, with multiple capacitors, you can see how the voltage is being uh, boosted up through that system. So, uh, so for example, with uh, at lower currents, you can get about two, two and a half volts. And once you start to get a couple of volts, then the electrical engineers can uh, transfer that to more effective voltage and current recovery. And in fact, we did this with more and more systems. This is four MFCs. And um, here, these uh, systems were hooked up uh, in with these capacitor circuits, and we got a good power density. This is four hooked up like batteries in series right before they crash, before they start shorting each other out. And you can see they're essentially identical. Um, so that was thinking about electrical power recovery from microbial fuel cells. What about uh, microbial electrolysis cells recovering hydrogen? These systems actually turn out to be a little bit simpler in, in uh, thought to scale up because you just take two electrodes, plop them down into the wastewater, and apply a potential, and the hydrogen comes up out of the water. So uh, in this system, we actually have done a larger scale test. We tested a 1,000 liter reactor. And before we did that, we got some data from some different wastewater sources to see which one might work best. And we looked at a domestic wastewater, a winery, a dairy, and a potato chip place, and 
based on the hydrogen production rates that we had in the system, the potato chip place worked the best. So where did we set up the reactor? Well, the winery, of course, because <laughs> we're not stupid. So we, uh, and in fact, if you want to do a field project and you're in Penn State in the winter, you choose Napa, California. Um, so we actually set the uh, reactor up in uh, Napa, California and ran the tests up there and uh, built this reactor. It was 144 electrode pairs, 24 modules, uh, really quite a nifty little design. We predicted that each module would have a certain amount of current flowing through it. That's that bar. And you can see we did, we did okay. Um, some not so well. Uh, but we learned a few things, but um, the bottom line was um, we, could, we could do it and we could predict it pretty well based on engineered systems. Um, in Newcastle, they've done an MEC on domestic wastewater with a somewhat different design, so we're starting to see in MEC some of these uh, designs go a little bit better. Um, this is sort of the reverse design. This is a really tiny one. This is sort of like the test tube MEC, and this is great because you can run the, you make one of these for about a buck and a half. Okay, so this brings me to uh, the last part of the talk, and um, I'll try and wrap it up in, in eight to ten minutes. Um, so you can do some other things. You can desalinate water. You can actually recover uh, phosphorus in the form of struvite. But the most interesting things uh, that we found is how to capture salinity gradient energy through reverse electrodialysis cells. Um, the the you know the the idea of using wastewater is great, but there's maybe 17 gigawatts in wastewater. If we can tap into cellulose energy, there's maybe uh, half a terawatt there. Salinity gradient energy may have an additional terawatt, at least globally. And then there are also sources of waste heat that we can similarly use to capture salinity gradient energy. So this is really getting into much bigger sources of energy now. So how can we do that? So if you were to express the difference in uh, electrochemical potential between a salt water and a fresh water, it would be equivalent to water flowing over a dam 270 meters tall. It takes a lot of energy to push fresh water out of salt water. So the reversible thermodynamics of that is if you have fresh water and salt water, there must be a big thermodynamic potential difference between those two. Um, and so that's why when you think of all the estuary water flowing into the ocean, there may be one to two terawatts of power. They say about one harvestable two that exists. So how can we do that? There are three different technologies basically to do this. I'm only going to talk about one. And this is called reverse electrodialysis. So let me first tell you what electrodialysis is. Electrodialysis is you take two electrodes, you put in some salt water, you apply a big voltage across that, and then you put in these membranes that let ions only go uh, in one direction. So cations can go through a cation exchange membrane. Anions go through an anion exchange membrane, but they can't go the other way. And so what happens is these anions are moving towards this electrode, the cations this way. This becomes less salty. This becomes more salty. That's how you desalinate water, electrodialysis. So if you reverse that, what happens? Well, you start off with a non-salty one and a salty one. So you have seawater here and, say, river water here. You don't apply a current now because the salt ions want to move out of the seawater into the river water. And you get all the negative ions going in that direction, all the cations going in that direction. And through these motion of ions, this electrochemical potential, you create per membrane pair about 0.1 to 0.2 volts of uh, about 0.1 to 0.2 volts. And so you can set up now an electrical current at the, uh, the far electrodes, and you can multiply that voltage just like you multiply batteries in a flashlight. So here's what something would look like. For example, you might, to split water, you would need about 10 to 20 of these membrane pairs, or about 1 to 2 volts. And at the anode, for example, you might be splitting water and forming oxygen. At the cathode, the electrodes would go, electrons would go around, combine with protons to form hydrogen. So this idea has been around for a long time. But you need 10 to 20 membrane pairs just to get going. And so you got to put a lot of membranes in there to capture any sort of energy back. So we thought, well, I know. How about if we just take a few of these membranes 
and we put them into our microbial fuel cell. Could we capture that energy more efficiently because now we have favorable reactions. We don't have to split water. We already have two reactions that are naturally thermodynamically favorable. So we did that. We put that in between the, uh, the electrodes. And instead of making a half a volt in the fuel cell, we are now making 1.3 volts. Instead of making about 0.7 watts per square meter, we were making about, um, uh, about five times that, about 4.5 watts per square meter. And the energy efficiencies, that is based on energy in the, the organic matter and salinity uh, gradients, was actually a recovery of about 42%. Typical power plants, only about 33%. Um, but we said, well, maybe not everybody's living by the ocean, although a lot of people live by the ocean. Um, what, how could we possibly tap into waste heat energy? And it turns out that um, there are certain chemicals, and one of them is ammonium bicarbonate, which can be evolved out of water at very low temperatures. So it's like distilling alcohol out of water, but in this case at much lower temperatures, 50 to 60 degrees C, you can distill off the ammonia and the CO2, and if you reconcentrate that, you can form a high concentrate and you leave behind a low concentrate stream. So you take that waste heat and you separate out these chemicals, and then you have a salty and a non-salty water. You use them, and then you reconstitute the salinity stream. So you capture that waste heat into salinity gradient energy, and instead of 270 meters for sodium chloride, it's closer to 400 meters for ammonium bicarbonate. Now, um, this is just about the end, but this is um, probably the most amazing part of seeing this work, okay? And um, we expected when we put this red stack with this ammonium bicarbonate into our microbial fuel cell that it would boost voltage. We had seen that uh, before, but we never tried it with wastewater. And wastewater, as I told you, is a really crummy power source. It's like way down here. When we tried it with wastewater, we way exceeded the amount of power that we were going to get. We got almost three watts per square meter. That was totally unexpected. And the, and the reason for it was somehow, because of this battery, this saltwater battery being in here, it actually flattened out these electrode potentials. And if these are flat, that means as you go to higher and higher currents, you just create more and more power. And so unexpectedly, we found that we not only could make the red stack uh, extract that energy very efficiently, but we could also now very efficiently extract the energy out of that wastewater and greatly produce the power production. And as a result, we greatly decreased the time we needed to treat the wastewater from many hours to just an hour or two. And so we took these two technologies that each had limitations alone, but combined could do something that was synergistic uh, and not just additive. Now, uh, the system would work like this with the distillation, capturing waste heat, and recycling this energy. And we can do this biotically. We can do it abiotically. But remember how I said that we needed to add that power source to make hydrogen? We no longer need a power source, an electrical grid power source. This salt water, fresh water, or ammonium bicarbonate waste heat system becomes the built-in power source. We need no electrical connections now, and we can involve hydrogen, and that hydrogen, of course, can be used for many different purposes. And the energy efficiencies can be quite high in these systems. So um, that's where we're at. Um, I hope, uh, sorry, a little bit delayed there in technical difficulties. But um, that's kind of where we're at in the development of these technologies. We've, we've dug more into the, the, the microbiology, which is fascinating and, and not nearly resolved. We've uh, developed the uh, materials that we think now have the ability to greatly improve the performance and reduce the cost of the materials. And we've, uh, this should say MECs, this, the MECs worked, um, it, it, although I, I think I failed to mention that in that particular case, most of the hydrogen was consumed by methanogen, so we actually made more methane than anything. Um, but we need to do some more pilot scale work, and that's really um, probably the next uh, greatest hurdle to the development of the technology. I want to thank my students. Uh, it's a, a picture uh, in uh, warmer times at Penn State. Um, it's a little snowy at the moment. And uh, 
We have some vehicles for dissemination of this on my website. Um, there's a new international organization of microbial, essentially fuel cell researchers. Um, there's some YouTube videos you can see, Twitter, you know, it's all social media. And um, of course, our always exciting webcam showing that fan spinning 24-7 in case, uh, you know, you get bored or you want to show your, uh, your uh, loved one something really exciting. And there's the book. And uh, anyway, thanks for your attention. Uh, appreciate your, uh, your indulgence. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I noticed your power problem, fuel cell, you said around 750 megawatts per hour. I noticed you used to get a million. And that fluctuates into about 70 microwatts per square centimeter. Yeah. And when you look at the performance coming through the tubes these days, you've got things like solar and like fuel cells. Yep. <laughs> okay, so the plan is we're not. <laughs> the short answer is we're not. Um, don't think about uh, driving your car based on one of these fuel cells. Um, that is not going to happen. In fact, if you, at least in a passive environment, were for diffusion to a surface, and you look at the kinetics and the reactivity of a biofilm, the best we could ever do based on sort of the laws of physics would be about 17 watts per square meter. That's all we can do in this system. Now, having said that, if you look at biological treatment systems, which currently we're building at very low cost to treat wastewater, if you translate the efficiency of, say, a trickling filter per area, it's about a watt per square meter. So actually, we're building systems that equivalent to the rate of organics removal are already in the same range as what we could probably get. So we're not going to be able to make them as small and as light as um, hydrogen fuel cells. We just can't compete with those energy densities. For wastewater treatment, we can probably reach hundreds of um, you know, um, uh, square meters per cubic meter in an industrial setting where we really can control the, the width of those things and we can shrink everything down, we could possibly get up to much higher current densities. But those would have to be very engineered systems and again, still not going to fit on the car. Sorry. <laughs> Um, they are a wonderful sensor of temperature. Basically, you can sit there and watch the voltage go up and the voltage go down based on the temperature. And if you take the system and you acclimate it at around 20 to 30 degrees and you put it in the refrigerator, it's almost a linear response between the refrigerator current production or the uh, power production to room temperature to almost 35 degrees. Just based I mean, it's amazing, it's linear, because you have all these changes in diffusion constants and, and uh, reaction rates and everything else, but it turns out almost a linear response. Um, so as I said, when you show this plot, the voltage versus time, yep. and there's like an up and down rate. Oh, yeah, you that, noticed that, huh? I'm just curious about some sort of like, act, like activity cycle, like between the phosphorus That was actually done in the constant temperature room, so it wasn't temperature. Um, what it was was the feed in those experiments was wastewater. And so what you have is a bottle of very non-homogeneous material sitting in a bottle of on ice in a 30 degree room and starting to get a little bit warmer. And uh, it's not equally sampled in the bottle. And that's, so that's just all variation in the feed. But if you, when you do that with acetic acid and phosphate buffer, Yeah, there's um, been a lot of interest uh, amongst uh, microbiologists to find out what these are, how to make them work better, which ones work better. Um, 
you know, so far most of the, the, the best performing microbes, I hate to say, uh, I don't hate to say, but it's, it, I was suspicious at first, but it's uh, uh, Geobacter. These are iron reducing bacteria, which have really, uh, in these systems, will outcompete most other bacteria and become the predominant microbes. And work with those microbes have produced altered cells through mostly selective pressure, not so much genetic manipulation that actually can achieve higher current densities. No. Well, they, um, uh, they, shall we say, exist almost everywhere. But um, whenever we want to deal with the new wastewater, we go to the, our domestic wastewater treatment plant, which has a nice, rich source of microbes. We throw that in there. And then when the wastewater is there, the microbes that can handle that wastewater grow and adapt and acclimate. And so, you know, we can get them anywhere, almost anywhere. Um, but they, you know, any rich source of microbes will eventually acclimate to produce. The community evolves because you might have fermentative organisms, you know, some that break down protein, some that are, uh, you know, electrogenic, some that are, you know, doing different parts of that complex organic matter breakdown. <sighs> I've been trying for 10 years to get ammonia to serve as an electron donor. Um, I, I must say, over the past few years, I haven't tried very hard. Um, but we would. Thermodynamically, it ought to happen. Practically, we're not making any progress. And so we've been, you know, the best we can do with ammonia is we can still aerate the wastewater and then get nitrate. And then that nitrate can actually come back and be used as an electron acceptor instead of oxygen. So we can get rid of the nitrogen if we want to, but we still haven't cracked that how do we get the ammonia oxidized? Is there a microbe out there that can do it, or are we just not creating the right condition for it? just don't know yet but boy whoever finds that I'll just I'll be happy to shake their hand or whatever <laughs> yes bioelectrochemically yeah, so it's the methanogens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I flew through that really fast. They're, the current densities for the electromethanogenesis are actually quite low. Um, however, if you recall the graph where I showed the uh, current densities for hydrogen evolution, if I make hydrogen, I can make methane exactly the same rate from that hydrogen. So we could achieve those high, uh, but we might need platinum to do that. Yes, molybdenum, molycyphal, yeah. We have not done electrochemical reduction. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, thank you. Well, yep, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, you know, it yeah, <laughs> leaves lots of room. You don't want to you don't want to answer all the questions right off the bat. So, uh, yeah, boy, when the pointer, this thing went dead in the middle there too. So I uh, grabbed my own part. Oh, thanks very much. I appreciate the questions too. Sure, sure. I noticed you were doing something we did many years ago. Okay. Biomass 